Hey, welcome to the Pastor Mike Drop Podcast. I'm back from vacation and so uh, thankful for everybody who filled in while I was away. It's kind of like the old uh, Tonight Show with Johnny Carson when he was gone. Yeah. Instead of just showing reruns, yes. he'd have a live host. And we have such a great team here. Of course, yeah. that's the way we got to go. Right, they Emily? Did. Yep, they did great. But yeah. we're glad you're back. They did. I'm, I, I'm, and you were gone for a week, too. And yes. put back last week. So yes. people are used to you again now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should reintroduce ourselves, right, to yes. the, the world. Uh, but thanks again to everybody who, who pinch hit. Yeah. Um, I was able to watch uh, from vacation, and it was it was better than ever. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was great. I, I mean, it really was great. But that's it's never because it's about us anyway. It's mm-hmm. because of this content we get to talk about. Mm-hmm. It's because of the Word. And we have two wonderful theologians and leaders in this church who are with us today. Go ahead and introduce them. Yes, please. we have Pastor Jeremy Johnson. Hi, Jeremy. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Good. Good. Good, Good message this weekend. Hey, thanks. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was Jamie, a great song. Jamie, it was, it's you fun, and Jamie. fun yeah. to preach with her. Yep. Yes. And Anna Eckley, a chaplain here. Hi, Hello. Anna. Hi again. Hi, Anna. How Hi. are you? Thanks Good. for coming back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we were, we were just talking about vacations. Have you guys been... On vacation this summer? You've been anywhere? We had vacation Bible school together. Yeah, yeah. We, did, we did that, yeah. Hope Island. We went to my parents' lake cabin up in northern Minnesota, nice. which yeah. is a staple vacation for us. Yeah. Excellent. We went to Disneyland in the beginning oh. of August with my niece and my nephew. The so happiest fun. So, place on yeah. earth. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's good. <laughs> Especially with two little ones. It's, <laughs> it's so happy. <laughs> you can see it through their eyes. <laughs> yes, right? yes. My nephew got one of those fans that sprays water, oh, and yeah. we call it Lewis, and that was his favorite part of Disneyland. Oh, how great. The, you yeah. called the fan Lewis? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, you could have yeah. saved a lot of money yeah. if you just gave him a fan beforehand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you mean you don't need any yeah. of these other things? Yeah. You just need a mm-hmm. fan called Lewis? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can do that. Don't tell <laughs> Walt that. Yeah. Walt doesn't want to know that Disney. Yeah. No, not at all. Well, so we're refreshed then. We're yeah. ready to go, and let's dive right in because we get to take a closer look at the, at Paul's letter to the Colossians and also the back half of Proverbs. So let's start with some questions. Mm-hmm. Why don't we just jump right in? Anybody got any questions? Oh, yeah. No, should have saw that coming. Okay. Why did Paul open so many of his New Testament letters with a greeting that included these two key words, grace and peace? Yeah. Um, I think, I believe that Paul opened so many letters with grace and peace because that is the foundation of our relationship with God. And Paul wanted that to be the foundation of his relationship with all the people that he wrote to. And when we've read it so many times, it's so easy to look over and say, ah, grace and peace again. Of course, Paul says grace and peace. But really, uh, if you think about when Paul was writing this, it's really quite important that he was saying grace and peace because it isn't peace as in peace that we think of like no war, but it's an inner peace as well as a peace with your community. Mm. So grace and peace with the people around you, peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I'm laying out everything I have in this letter to you because yeah. I love you so much. Grace and peace. Mm. Yeah. yeah I, I, and also in, in the time when, when letters would go out to communities, this peace would be something that they would say, like, hopefully that there's peace among you. Mm. And then Paul tags on to that as well, is there's mm-hmm. grace to you, this mm-hmm. grace that comes from God, that, that coupled with God's peace is this primary signifier indicator of, of what they were talking about, who they were as followers of Jesus. Paul, Paul's you know, brilliant, obviously, and he's inspired by the Holy Spirit as he's writing these things, so that kicks it up about five billion notches as well. You put that combination together, and I think it's worth noting, when, when somebody inspired by the Holy Spirit who's that brilliant is writing letters and there's these repeated phrases, mm-hmm. grace, peace, he starts so many of his letters with those words. And even in Colossians, in chapter 4, verse 18, he ends it with that. And so he says, so grace again to you. So he begins and ends. It's, it's like the book ends to, to this letter to the Colossians. The thing about it isn't just the words grace and peace, like you guys were saying. It's the source of that grace and peace is God. It isn't something that we can, you know, work our way towards spiritually. It isn't something that we can attain. It isn't something we can earn. It's a gift. It's a mm-hmm. free gift. It's given. And, you know, there's a radicalness to, to grace. Anna, you, you kind of alluded to this, that these, are, these could just be words. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think in churches and amongst church people, we let that happen too easily. It's like, oh yeah, grace, peace. Yeah, we we get mm. it. Those are those are church words. They mm-hmm. bounce around the halls of a sanctuary, and you know, you hear the preacher, the Bible study teacher, talk about those things, or we read them when we're reading through the Bible. And 
we don't pause to soak it up. So I'd encourage our podcast listeners right now just to pause for a moment and soak mm. it up. There is a God who loves you and it has nothing to do with your performance and what you've done and how good you are, how good I am or how good any of us are and, and how religious we are and how moral we are. God just gives it to us. It's like, so the Iowa State Fair just wrapped up. Did you go? Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> I saw pictures actually, yes. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was great. Do you we're, usually go? No, we're not good fair people, but it was so fun. Now you're going to be hooked. I think so. It yeah. was a great time. That is a great time. So anyway, if you go to the state fair and if you go to one of those games, you uh -huh. know, where you want a big, mm -hmm. win one of those <laughs> over life-size teddy bears or mm -hmm. something, and you got to make three baskets in a row mm -hmm. in order to do it. So back in the day, I tried to do that for my, at the time, girlfriend, Sally. And, you know, I'm like, well, I play basketball. This can't be too hard. And of course they shrink the rims and, and, and overinflate the balls. So it doesn't quite fit. And I was so frustrated and I was like, God, I'm not making these shots. This is terrible. I just want to win her the big giant, mm -hmm. bigger than me teddy bear, because apparently that would make her love me more or something. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to earn this sure. prize. I'm trying to earn this reward. I'm trying to earn this gift. Grace would be if the guy, and he didn't, but if the guy at the booth said, it's okay, you didn't make the shots, but here's the teddy bear. Here, here, mm -hmm. Here's the gift. Only way better because we're not just talking about a stuffed toy that's going to wear out quickly mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe would have worn out before we got home because how do you fit it in the car? Mm -hmm. But it's a gift that goes on forever. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a gift of eternity. It is a gift um, that has no end to it. It is the gift of salvation. It is the gift of the forgiveness of our sins. It is the gift of things that we can't earn or deserve. So now hear it again. Paul says grace and peace to you because the grace leads to the peace. And the Greek word for peace is erinus, which literally means all the parts of life come together as a whole, that there's wholeness in your life. And the only place we're going to get that is from God mm -hmm. and through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's going to actually lead us into the next Absolutely. few questions mm -hmm. uh, because there is only one place to get this peace. Yeah. Next question is, what is heresy and how does Paul push back against the heresies about Jesus that infiltrated the church in Colossia? Yeah, so this exactly the way that Paul starts this letter is he's saying it's grace and peace that comes from Jesus because in the Colossian church, there were these heresies which were false teachings. Basically, they were taking the message of Jesus, and Paul talks about it to the church in Corinth, I only told you about Christ, the one who was crucified. And so Paul is going into this, talking to this church that he didn't start, and he's telling them all of these things that um, and correctives because there are a bunch of people that were teaching these false things like it was Jesus plus all these other things. Yeah. It was Jesus plus this special uh, knowledge that there was this heresy that um, it was only the spirit that was good and anything that was created and matter in and of itself was evil. Well, you know, that goes against the, the reality that Jesus was human and divine. And so... Mm -hmm. Paul is speaking to these uh, these false teachings, and and he goes into it, and right away he comes, and he and he talks about. Let me tell you, it's Christ, the visible image of the invisible God. You want to know where the where the very foundation of all of truth lies. Let's look to Jesus, and let's look to Jesus alone. Not all these other things, not not these special things that you can concoct and try to build this uh, improvement plan on these things. Let's let's start with Jesus and Jesus alone to correct the false teachings that can come about. And that's not just in the church in Colossia; mm. that's in the church today as well. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is, and there's you know people say, "Well, heresies that's something back in the day. It really has nothing to do with us, but it has." Sadly, everything to do with us. There are modern day heresies. I, I want to read just an excerpt from this because this is this is poetry. This is this is just beautiful beautiful word choices. Starting in verse fifteen of Colossians one, and you started there, Jeremy. But I want to read on a little more. Christ is a visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. So Paul goes from spirit, you know, Jesus is God. Jesus is bigger than just a, a great person, a great teacher, a great prophet. He's also um, this this divine. He, he is the creator. He is, he, you can't 
completely pull him apart from the, the identity and the essence of God. There's one God in three persons, the mystery of the Trinity. But then Paul goes to, but he's also human. Mm-hmm. He's also, he also has a body, and his body is us, the church, the body of Christ. He's the beginning, supreme over all. Uh, who rise from the dead, for he is first in everything. So he physically died and he physically rose from the dead to give us hope. And that's where the grace comes from that leads to the peace. And that peace is this tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot uh, or whatsoever sort that is. In other words, there's this calm and quiet confidence that comes to us because Jesus is is it. Mm. <laughs> Jesus is everything we need. Jesus is the bomb. Yeah. And I, when I was reading through this, I thought, I know it speaks to the heresies of their time, but it also speaks to a heresy of our time. Uh, and that is uh, people believing that the universe is actually the ultimate power. Right. Mm-hmm. We can send our thoughts to the universe. There's different energies. And it's so just amazing how right here it says, even Jesus is uh, God is the creator of the universe and he has reconciled the universe. So even this ultimate power that people go around saying it's the universe. Well, there's a being over the universe and that's Mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. Right. That, I'm so glad you brought that up. And we've talked about that before, actually, around a VBS skit, Mm -hmm. which which we were writing and and you just really grabbed onto that line. (laughs) Look, there's probably going to be some listeners right now who are on the fence about all this stuff, who dabble in some spiritual stuff that borders on new age Look, we love you. We're, we're not mad at you. We're, we're not like here to shame you or anything like that. But we're also here to tell you when you read the truth of God's word, we have really good news for you. Mm. You can stop the striving and the pursuing of trying to become something special spiritually by your own volition, by your own work, by your own effort, and just receive this gift of who Jesus is. He's more than enough. He conquers all these things. There's a question about that in more specificity later, so I'll I'll save a little bit of that. But there are plenty of modern-day heresies. There's universalism and and relativism where we say, oh, well, Jesus is fine for some people, but he isn't going to save you for everybody. Well, you can't read the New Testament and Mm. say that. Mm. You're going to be in conflict with God's word if you say that. And you can choose to do that, but you're going to be in conflict with God's word. That's just not what Scripture says. Um, there's prosperity gospel, which is a modern day heresy that has bubbled up in a really powerful and dangerous way that kind of encourages people to say, well, don't worry so much about Jesus other than he's a means to an end. He's, he's the guy who's going to make you more famous. He's the guy who's going to make you more rich. He's the, he's the guy who's going to give you a little boost um, and, and allow you to reach your real goals in life, which are worldly goals. Well, those are the wrong goals. Mm-hmm. And so if those are our goals, we won't be satisfied. We won't be whole. We won't have that peace mm-hmm. that Paul talks about right from the beginning. Uh, there's Arianism, which is God made Jesus, but Jesus is not God. Jesus is just a good teacher. There's uh, Pelagianism, which is original sin doesn't exist, and that still exists today. Well, well, we're all good people. We we don't have any issues. Christianity says just come clean. <laughs> just just mm-hmm. admit it's, it's so honest and it's so refreshing. Just tell the truth. Uh, there's Christian nationalism, there, that which we talked about on other podcasts. There's all these things that bubble up that really sound good at first, but it's like my drive off of the first tee of a golf course. You hit it and it's, <laughs> it's going to go long and it feels good. And, and it's, and it's just, but there's just something off about it and just one or two degrees. And then it spins a little bit out of control. And then I'm two fairways away <laughs> from where I'm supposed to be because it was just a little bit off, you know, mm-hmm. just, just one degree off where my club head hit the ball. That's the problem with these heresies. They sound religious. Mm-hmm. They sound spiritual. They sound like, well, it's just another candy bar. You like this candy bar. I like that candy bar. It, it's all candy and it's all good. No, it's <laughs> not. It's not all good. Some of it's poison. And then there's the really good stuff. And the good stuff is Jesus. Maybe we should have a Jesus candy bar. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> good. Or not. Useful at times. Yeah. Uh, all the time. I'm liking all your analogies today. The fair first like i wish the guy with the teddy bear would have just given it to our children without all our money and now your golf ball analogy like it looked good and then it wasn't mine just wouldn't from the get-go so well, you see, gotta this, watch out this is the opposite of some of these heresies where we do live in a real world we're not just spirit <laughs> beings you know or our spirits well, well we'll go on to that in the yes. next question yeah. 
What's wrong with Gnosticism? Everything. Okay. And where does it pop up in our world today? What's the truth about God's mysterious plan? All right. Look at Colossians chapter two, verse two. Paul says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan. So it almost sounds like Paul's getting Gnostic. There was like, because Gnosticism is this, there's this uh, mysterious truth that's out there that only certain special spiritual people or certain special Christians who have certain special knowledge that they've discovered somewhere along the way have acquired. And that's the secret plan. That's the mysterious plan of God. And so they need to enlighten all the rest of it because they've Mm -hmm. found this one secret special thing that is not some big public truth. It's this private little thing that was hidden in a cave, you know, for years or centuries, and then they found it, and now they're 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 spreading it to everybody else. But then Paul does this big turn, this twist in verse two. He says, "So I want you to understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ, mm-hmm. which is Jesus Christ Himself. Period. Done. That's it." And in verse 8, he goes on to say, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers. The message translation says the spiritual tyrants of this world rather than from Christ. And we'll get to that in more detail next. But Gnosticism is this this age-old heresy. And there are, historians will say that Gnosticism hadn't fully formed when Paul wrote this letter, but there were the root systems of it. So that would come a century or so later, the actual like formation of Gnosticism, and it was called Gnosticism. But before that, it, its roots were going down and it was starting to bubble up in these ways, which said, you know, Jesus is not really God, um, that God is, is, is the creator, but the spirit but that's the physical God, and he made mistakes, is Gnosticism. And, and so all material things and physical things are bad and evil and wrong. And then there's this spiritual God who's all right. And so we just need to get to that God and get away from the physical and get to the material, which leads to all sorts of really dangerous applications, which is who cares about this world? Mm-hmm. Who cares about everybody else? Let's, let's just wander off and find my own spirituality and, 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 and escape. And it also has this myth that I have some sort of pure spirit that's trapped inside of my body mm. and that my body is a mess. It leads to asceticism, which is another heresy on one hand, which is this denial of myself where I become a, a martyr and I just, you know, I, I will not give, I, in, I will not pursue anything that produces pleasure or joy or anything in life. That's one ditch. The other ditch is, well, if my body is evil and bad anyway, I can do anything I want with it. I, I, I can just pursue anything I want that satisfies me temporarily and because my spirit will escape eventually and then I'll be okay. Does this sound like Jesus to you? Does this sound like scripture to you? This is the problem. And this was infiltrating the church in Colossia. And that's why Paul says, but he does it so brilliantly. Mm-hmm. Instead of just like beating him over the head with it, he says, hey, you know, look, here's who Jesus is. He's more than just spirit. He's also man. He's human. And here's who we are. We're more than just, we're also human. We also have flesh. And there's a real, I love this about Christianity. There's a real practical down to earth part to it. Uh, it's, it's essential part of it. The two natures of Christ reflect on who we are too, is that we have this hope of heaven and we do have spirit, but we also have body and flesh. And there's a resurrection of the body, not just the soul, but our bodies will be resurrected to new and everlasting life. That's really good news. Mm-hmm. The thing I love about, a couple of things, the thing I love about Paul and all of these letters and how important it is for us today is everything gets back to Jesus. Yeah. Everything. everything gets back to Jesus. The other thing in this question, we're using some words, I think that some people hear, you hear Gnosticism and you're like, well, I've heard people talk about that, but I've also heard people say agnostic. Yep. And what's the difference there? We hear the word atheist. And so good. just a really fun yeah. base, like, root word of things. Gnosis is knowledge. So Gnosticism is the worship of secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. Agnostic would be, I don't believe in any kind of knowledge or truth. Or I don't know. Or I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. atheism is theos, is the word for God, is atheism is I believe that there is no God. And so here we get into this kind of some language that we, 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 we hear and we can start to understand where those words come about and how we talk about them. 
It is really helpful. Yeah. And also, I think that this is a really great reason why it's so important for us to be in the word. Because I remember going into seminary, we had this reading that was due before the first day of class, and it was about Gnosticism. And I remember reading it, and I was like, that sounds great. And I wasn't the only one in my class, because our teacher got quite frustrated with us (laughs) that we didn't know that much going into seminary. But when you just take what people say without doing your own research and without doing your own reading, without having your own time with God, then that's how we easily get veered off. But if you are always taking what people say or taking what you learn and checking it with your relationship with God, then I am confident that there will be redirection. I also think part of being a church and like having wise counsel around you. And I'm reminded like Paul, like you said, Mike continues to bring clarity of Mm -hmm. like, you're thinking all these things up here, but Jesus Mm -hmm. And that's still our world today is like the world's going to tell you you need to do all these things or believe all these unique things, but Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so being reminded that in this place. That's such a good point, Emily. And these are root issues Mm -hmm. that lead to all sorts of weeds, Mm -hmm. you know, on on the outside that if we don't get the root stuff in a, in a biblically faithful way, it's going to, it's going to come out sideways and people say, okay, you're talking about Gnosticism, but I'm still a little unclear what that is. It's fortune tellers. It's mm-hmm. it's people mm-hmm. who want to read your palm, and it, you don't need Jesus for that. I'll, I'll tell you what only God knows. It's original sin. It's it's uh, people who say you got to pray a certain way in order to mm-hmm. really get right with God. You got to get baptized a certain way. You, the way you did it wasn't good enough, and, and your denomination doesn't get it enough. And so you have to do it our way in order. In order, the, the, the root system of all those heresies is Gnosticism. The, the root system is, like you said, this secret knowledge. Uh, that's what the word literally means. And it's what it is, is it's minimizing God and maximizing us, which is the opposite of any hope that we can have, which is like you guys have been saying, and, we've, and Paul is saying, more importantly, to the Colossians, stop minimizing Jesus. Put him back to the place of the throne uh, of the Lord, uh, mm-hmm. not just Savior, but Lord, and minimize your humble yourself. Gnosticism is God's not really that great, but we could be great, and so now we're evening the playing field. That's original sin. Mm-hmm. The Bible is so good at correcting these things. You know, we're going to read that later in Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy. The Bible's useful for correction and and and, and to keep us on course, to keep us from hitting the drive two fairways away. It, which is not going to end well for anybody. Plus, you can conk somebody on the head coming the other way. This this comes out sideways, and it's it's messy. And that's why we need to know. We don't have to necessarily know that it's called Gnosticism. We don't have to necessarily know. We just need to make sure. Let, I guess I'd sum it up this way. Let Jesus be Jesus. Let him be God. Let him be Savior. Let him be Lord. And stop thinking we can become Savior and Lord. That's really at the heart of Gnosticism. Mm. I was just it made me think about how many times people will give you a book or a podcast that say, hey, here's what it is, but if you read this or listen to this, then you'll truly get it. And it's uh, all that Jesus plus this little nugget that you know maybe I know that nobody else has had the ability to know before me. And we are just scratching the surface. Yes. I mean, we haven't even gotten to 1% of it. There's, there's a whole rabbit trail you can follow on this stuff. But if you're interested, you can, and we can talk to you about it. And I love to talk about this <laughs> stuff all day long. But... Heresies, bad. Jesus, good. That's what Paul's saying. That's a good word. How does Paul calm any potential fears of first and 21st century readers who might be intimidated by spiritual tyrants? Yeah, this is so... It's just Paul keeps on just kind of bringing... He's, the fire hose is open, and he's mm-hmm. hitting all of these things. And so if we, we go to Second Colossians, and if we start back at the... You know, second the, chapter of Colossians. Second chapter yeah. of Colossians, sorry. Uh, verse 14, he canceled the record that contained the charges against us, and he took it and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. In this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the, Christ, on the cross of Christ. Then you go down to verse 20. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the evil powers of this world. <laughs> it, it's this, this reminder of we... When we're joined to Jesus in faith, this gift that God gives us, we talked about that in the, in the book of Ephesians, when just faith, daring to trust in God's promises, and they might be true for you, that gives us the ability to know that we don't really have anything to fear. Now, there are things that are going to happen that aren't going to be comfortable, they aren't going to be good, but there's a lot of fear that we live under 
wondering if we're, if we're doing it right. Somebody's told us we're doing it wrong. And Paul again is saying, don't forget the power of the resurrection and what happens when you're joined to that. And mm-hmm. you don't have to live in fear of that any longer. You don't have to live like, I, am, am I okay? Am I okay? I think I, I'm sure we all could go around this table and talk about all the people that come to us and say, I just want to know. Am I okay? Because somebody may have told me that I'm not doing enough or all of this. And Paul's saying, no, Jesus is enough. And you're joined to him. And it's a steady stream of really good people who've been Christian their whole lives. Mm -hmm. But there's so much noise out there that deceives uh, good Christian people to say, you might not be doing enough. Or you should be intimidated by these demons or, or these spiritual supernatural things. And you know, Time Life has a whole series of books that you can yeah. subscribe to on that. You, you, you should, you should, you know, when you see some of these movies, you know, about uh, omens and spirits and all these, oh, oh my goodness, that, that's really intimidating and scary. Unless you have Jesus. Yeah. And then it's a nothing. I mean, it's an absolute nothing. That's what Paul's saying. This Jesus, who you know, Colossians, but you've just been um, influenced in the wrong way. You've been misled. Go back to this Jesus that you met once upon a time and let him be who he is. Let, let him be the conqueror of, of all enemies. Now that puts in perspective all these you know, ghosts and goblins and, and, and the scary things. It's why we don't have to be worried about Halloween. It's why we don't have to be worried about any of this stuff. It, we've got Jesus. Let's start acting like it. Mm, that's good. What does it mean to think about the things of heaven, and how does thinking that way help us get on the right side of the detailed list in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 17? Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Before we started the podcast, we were giving out questions, and when I took this one, I just said, our education might be a little different here. And Mm -hmm. so for anyone out there who thinks that all of us think the exact same thing, and all of us have the exact same experience in education... Mm -hmm. We all come from very different places. But when we, going back to the question, when we talk about things of heaven and heaven on earth, uh, it's really fun to think about heaven. It's really beautiful, as it should be, because Mm. heaven is a place of joy. Heaven is a place where there is no more sorrow. There is no Mm. more crying. And so it's really easy to maybe get caught up in two things. We could either get caught up in thinking, who cares about earth? Let's just get to heaven. Or we could get caught up in thinking, the opposite, which I lost my train of thought of what that is. Sure. Which would, which would be, well, we're just all thinking about earth yeah. all the time and, yes. and yeah. who cares Thank about you. heaven. Yeah. 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 But so when we think about heaven, then we think about how good Jesus is that we have this promise of an eternal gift. Uh, we don't necessarily have to wait for it. And there are different things that we can do in our own life and in our own hearts and in our own minds to experience little glimpses mm-hmm. of heaven here mm-hmm. on earth. And that's where this list that's kind of what's demonstrated in this list. No slander. Uh, be kind. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, compassion. If we all walk around with those things, we're going to get as close to heaven as we can mm. here. That's such that that's such a good summary, Anna, of it all. And the the danger is, I heard a brilliant theologian uh, talk about this, but not as succinctly as you did, that we can lose our way when we get too focused on one or the other, heaven or earth. I think uh, having a balance there is important. We live in this world. All right, look around. What, how, how can you bring more of heaven to earth? I mean, we pray for that in the Lord's Prayer, on yeah. earth as it is in heaven. And so how is it in heaven? Well, that's the list mm-hmm. that you mentioned here in Colossians 3. You know, Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Forgive each other. Do, do these things that Christians do. Here's I just... Man, I, I'm so glad we get to talk about these things. And I hope this helps just somebody out there who's like, okay, I'm going to do the good list. I'm going to start, do, I'm gonna st- mm. start doing the good list more. I'm going to stop doing the bad list. And that's going to last about as long as, as, a, as a well-intended alcoholic who's trying to stop drinking on his own or her own. So I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to start doing healthy things. And how many times do we make vows like this? about our health, our well-being, our, our, our attitudes, the way we're going to live. I'm going to do more of this. I'm going to do less of that. It's the New Year's resolution approach to life. And it very sometimes works, but very rarely holds. We're going to need something more. We're, we're going to need something. And, and to get to the good list, the love, forgiveness list, the peace list, the, the, the compassion list, and to get away from the list of all the sinful things that Paul lists there. He's fond of making lists. We, we started to notice in these yeah. letters. How do you get from the bad list to the good list? It's Jesus. 
in, instead of saying, I have to do, or you have to repent, you have to do all these things, you have to stop doing these things and start doing these things, how's that going for everybody? Instead of that, it's a surrender. It's a surrender to God's will. It's to say, I'm going to change the way I think. I'm going to start thinking of things of heaven. I'm going to start trying to bring more of heaven to earth. I'm going to change the way I think about these things. That's going to inspire the 10% of our con- congregation that's in recovery from addictive behaviors to live a new life one day at a time. And they don't go back. Because, and they sell, a, a guy just posted on Facebook, 34th birthday you know, of mm-hmm. new life from not drinking anymore. Alcoholism was his life. And now he's like, it's probably half his life. He's got to be in his late 60s now. And he says, so it's my 34th birthday. Celebrate with me. How many times do you think he tried to quit? on his own. Mm -hmm. How many times do you think you tried to go from the bad list to the good list on his own? Here's how you get there. Change the way you think. Surrender. What is, what do the 12 steps teach us from AA? Well, they're Bible based. They're right out of Colossians and other places. Admit that you have a problem, surrender to a higher power to God. um, and, And then the power comes in and it starts to change us. That's how repentance happens. Repentance literally means change the way we think. It doesn't mean stop being bad, start being good. That's only going to happen when we change the way we think. Mm-hmm. I, so our our kids are only eighteen months apart, and so because of that, and their teenage age, they they get sick of each other, and we get sick of them, like that whole thing. <laughs> and uh, so, but here's the thing: um, when they're frustrated with each other, my question to them always is: is what what are you thinking about the other person? Mm. Because so often, I think Paul's saying, "Set your eyes on things above." Yes. We, it's really easy to look at a person, at a system, at ourselves, and we look at it with really a deficit mindset. And so what, what, what I'm trying to get my kids to do, which I need to take lessons from that encouragement, is what does Jesus think about this? Mm-hmm. What does Jesus think about me? What's the truth of God? What's the truth of his love? What's the truth of Jesus? And when, when that becomes the focal point that I'm fixing on, it's amazing how things change. Like if, if there's somebody who I feel has just wronged me, it's really easy for me to continue to feel how wronged I've been and that person becomes my enemy. Mm. But when I recognize that that person probably wronged me unintentionally out of a place of hurt and I can start to think about that person as somebody who, like me, is in need and deserving of God's love and grace... Now I can look at that person with compassion. I can look towards solution rather than exacerbating a problem. And Paul says, so let's think about our lives and focus on the realities of the love and the grace of Jesus Christ and see how our communities change. And I wonder, especially in this year coming up, how important that will be for all of us. Mm, When we think about the things of heaven, it reminds us who we are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just remind us who God is and who Christ is. It reminds us who God has made us to be and how Christ has redeemed us. And like you're saying, when we do that, it changes us. That's where the transformation happens. It doesn't happen because I will myself to be better. It happens because I I don't even start with changing the way I think. I start with Jesus' sacrifice. I start with what God has done. I I start with grace that leads to peace, which is where Paul starts his his letter and ends his letter. Then our behaviors change once we realize who we are, not because someone shamed us into changing our behaviors, which is the way too much of Christianity does this and teaches this. Let me shame you for who you are and what you do and get you to change because of that. Well, good luck. You know, instead, just let God remind you who you are. Mm-hmm. Let God remind mm-hmm. you what, what he's made me to be. Now, I'm not just talking about yeah. you. I'm talking about me. This is a struggle. And I also want to say this. And I want to say this like, and I've graduated from these problems in my life. And so therefore, just do it like I do. This is a struggle. And we will all fail. And we, because, because it's distracting this world and it's easy to live for the glory of myself or the glory of somebody else or the glory of, uh, of worldly goals or whatever it might be instead of the glory of God. But when I get life right, my eyes are on heaven, my eyes are on Jesus. And then that brings more of heaven to earth in my life. This has been a, a practice of mine for, for some time now, because this is something that I'll, I'll struggle with. Like I'm in, like in my own, my own personal thing is... And so when, one of the, when I end my devotion in the morning, it's God, allow me to see others the way you see them today. It's huge. Mm. And if I can start my day there, I feel like at least I have a fighting shot, you know, like mm-hmm. let me see others the way that you see them. And it just hopefully 
setting my eyes there helps to change a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And also when we look at this list, uh, how much of it actually lines up with the things that we are asking for? Uh, for example, if we are striving for status, there's nothing about status on here. <laughs> if we're striving yeah. for more money in our salary, there's no salary in here. But instead, what if we strive to be kind and patient? What if we strive to see others, how God sees them? So just that's also challenging like, where are your desires, and do they line up with the desires that God has for us? Absolutely. It's That's one good. of the Proverbs that we're reading this yeah. week, mm-hmm. um, and I'll just paraphrase it and try not to botch it too much, but instead of living for worldly material things that aren't going to satisfy your soul, live for things that are more significant, the virtues of life, the, the kindness, like you said, or how do you get a good reputation? Well, you don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't hurt people. You don't, you don't make life all about you. Uh, you don't manipulate people. You don't. You don't try to wiggle your way through things. You surrender all that. You 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 change the way you think. You get your eyes on heaven. And yeah, we spent a lot of time on this one, well, but it's, it's big. Good. Yeah, it is big. What do you want our podcast listeners to know about Paul's mm-hmm. instructions for wives, husbands, children, and parents? This one gets a little trippy for people because it starts, wives, submit to your husbands. This is fitting to those who belong to the Lord. We know from, so we call this God's electric power company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. We know from Ephesians, Paul kind of hit this too. And there it's a little more clear and Paul's consistent. And so he says, submit to one another. And then he says, wives to husbands, husbands to wives. So we have a consistency with Paul. So we know that he doesn't just mean one direction. But it's also really important to know the historical context. Mm -hmm. This is first century Rome. This is not 21st century North America or Western Europe. This is first century Roman culture where... Um, men were in charge of their households. Women, their wives, were in essence property, and so were their children. And so men were like the lord of the manor. You know, the the they were the king of the castle of their own home, their household, and that would include anybody else who was a part of their household. And in Roman first century culture, some who had a lot of uh, money, uh, well, were well to do, would have slaves too. Well, they were considered part of the family as well, part of the household, and so. Paul is just blowing that out of the water Mm -hmm. in a radical way. He's saying, you know what, men, you're not in charge. Jesus is in charge of your house. He's the head of your household. You have the honor of having a wife submit to you as you would submit to her in other ways. She'll submit to you. And and then the two can become one. Instead Instead of pulling against each other in a tug of war, you're pursuing each other where the husband says, how can I serve you, my wife? And the wife says, how can I serve you, my husband? Well, now you really got something. Now you've got a family where Christ is Lord and he's bonding you together and the two truly become one. He goes on to say, you know, kids, obey your parents. Uh, Parents, don't exasperate your children and aggravate them the way it's so easy to do in a youth sports culture uh, Mm -hmm. where we want our kids to be little human performers and to have been trophy winners and that somehow that's going to make us better people if they win. I went through all that and I know those temptations are big and our kids were athletic and all that kind of stuff. And so it's like, it's never enough. You know, you always want, well, yeah, well, but, but you, you got that, but then that other kid got this. So maybe if you just tried a little harder, you could get that too. And boy, did I learn that lesson hard ways, you know, fortunately early on and and then I repented and changed the way I thought. Uh, But Paul's here saying the way the world does family is not the way Christians should do family. The way Christians do family is, what can I give to you? What, what can I give to you, the, the, the members of this household? And to be, to be the Christ-like uh, uh, husband or, or father of the house, well, what kind of a leader was Christ? He's the one who took a knee and washed the feet of his, of, of his household, of his family, his disciples. He's the one who went to a cross. He's the one who died for his family. Um, okay, there it is. That's men. You, you want to know what your role is? It's total service and surrender and submission to your wife and kids and household and the people you're responsible for. One of the things I think is so beautiful about the way that Paul writes is he, and he talks about it in Corinthians where he says, I, I've become all things to all people, but he does it in his writing in a way that he starts the thought out in a way where people are like, oh, I'm tracking with you. Yeah. I'm tracking with you. And then he spins it because of the gospel, because the gospel turns an upside down world uh, and turns it right, right side up. And so he's like, you know, he starts off, wives submit to your husbands. And there are some people reading that would be like, oh, good. And then he's like, and then here's the way that that looks. And then it, he subverts it in the best possible way. 
and he changes the course of the way in which we see the world and how it should work. And it's just so beautiful. And he's, he's such a genius. Mm -hmm. And this may not fit 21st century cultural norms, but it certainly pushed buttons in first century Roman cultural norms. And, and I think humbly 21st century cultural norms maybe should also pause for a moment and say, are, have we really improved it? Yeah. You know, um, I don't mean over first century Roman culture. I mean over what Paul is prescribing here, mm -hmm. which is you're here to serve each other. You're here to love each other. You're here to honor each other. Uh, you're here to care for each other. You mentioned slavery. So clarity question for you. Is the Bible pro-slavery or is there something else more going on in Colossians 3, 22 through 4, 1? There is something else more going on That's uh, in, in <laughs> Colossians 3 and 4, because people will read this in verse 22. Paul says, slaves, obey your earthly master, masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do, and here's the twist. You know, Jeremy, you talked about Paul, like, just moving along, and anybody who'd be pro-slavery, nasty people. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> anybody no doubt. be like, oh, yeah, see, the Bible talks about slavery, like it's something that it's endorsing. I would challenge you on that thought, first of all. It never endorses slavery. Mm -hmm. It never says slavery is God's ideal in, or idea mm -hmm. or what God has ordained or wants the, in the way he wants to be. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 21 and 22 make it very clear. Paul is saying, hey, freedom for slaves would be a good thing. And we also know in this country, if we know our history um, in the 1800s, that it was Christians who led the movement to abolish slavery in this country because... They couldn't justify slavery mm -hmm. in this country with what their faith taught them through Scripture. So Scripture teaches freedom. I mean, it's the central story of the Old Testament is people being set free from slavery into the freedom of a new life in a promised land. So when Paul's saying this, he's saying, given that we live in a fallen world and there mm -hmm. are slaves, here, slaves, let me give you some encouragement. When you're working for a master in, in your home who is um, you know, not treating you well, the way a lot of slave owners would not, just remember that you're working for the Lord, really, and that that person is not really your Lord. Jesus is your Lord, and Paul will say, hint here, and but also make it very clear elsewhere, when Jesus is your Lord, you are free, <laughs> and nobody enslaves you. It doesn't matter what the world says. You are, as, you are more free than your slave owner because you're in a relationship with Christ. Uh, but I think more importantly here, just generally, that Paul is, is connecting into a culture where since this is part of a cultural norm, I want to make it easier for slaves. I want to make it better for slaves. I want to say that you should be treating one another um, in a respectful way. Chapter 4, verse 1, masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master. It isn't you. Mm -hmm. uh, your master and your Lord is Jesus. And in the totality of Scripture, it's very clear the Bible is anti-slavery. And in Colossians 4, there's a hint that kind of sets us up for Philemon where there's this slave named Onesimus. Were you going to talk about that? I'll, I'll save it no, if you were. Great. No, But yeah. Onesimus um, is a slave, and Paul's basically saying, receive him as a fellow brother yep. in Christ. Mm. Well, okay, he's not a slave anymore. You can't look at people by worldly status. You look at them through the eyes of heaven again. And there, there it is again. When we see this world through the eyes of heaven, we don't just see... Other people differently, we see ourselves differently. It's, it's Paul who says, there's no longer Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, male nor female, for Amen. we are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's it. God's ideal. Yeah. Good clarity. What does Colossians 4, 6 teach us about the words we choose as Christians, and why does it matter? Mm. It teaches us that our words are important because who we are as a witness is important. Mm -hmm. And the best way that I think I can illustrate this is if you've ever had a conversation with someone who was just really grumpy, maybe, <sighs> and I'm sure I've been that person too, so I'm sorry, but, and you're just like, I, I haven't don't... had that conversation <laughs> no. with you yet, well, no, yeah. but know. I'm sure it'll come. Maybe yeah. Then. You, you have freedom to do that. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, and at the end of the conversation, you're either like, thank goodness that conversation's over. <laughs> mm. Or you're like, I really never need to speak to that person again. Or do they even like me? And that's because our words are so important. They can put so many things in our mind and in our heart. So if our words aren't pointing to Jesus, mm. then, then that's deterring people. And I really, I found this quote that I really like, and it's our words reflect our character and our character reflects the character of Christ. Because as Christians, that's who we are pursuing. Uh, we're pursuing those values and those traits of Christ in our own life. And so our words can either bring life to Christ and be a tool of resurrection mm. or 
the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you choose to make your words a tool of life. Don't be the opposite. Don't be the opposite. Don't be the opposite. <laughs> words are powerful. What, what were you told as a kid? Sticks and stones may break my bones, mm. but words will never hurt me. And that was the biggest, like, that was the biggest untruth we could ever have. And so, I, you know, you, you just nailed it, is are you using these gifts that we have in the language that we've been given as a way to build up or tear down? I had a mentor of mine at one point say, when I said something that wasn't kind, she said... Was that for your benefit or for mine? Mm. And I just thought, boy, that 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 kind of reduced me to realizing like how impactful the words that I was say- that I was saying actually were. Mm. It's so hard, and and because it's usually for us that we say those things that are sideways and mm-hmm. off and wrong. Uh, it's humbling to be reminded that it's probably because something inside isn't right. Yep. Mm-hmm. So so it, not this, it, sure. It's really easy to see what's wrong with people and with the yeah. world and, and criticize. Somebody told me once, um, who's no longer with this church, <laughs> came and said, Pastor, I have the spiritual gift of, um, of complaining and um, seeing what's wrong, you know, and so I'm here to help you with that and I'm starting with you. I'm like, well, it's not a spiritual gift. It's nowhere in the Bible is a spiritual gift. Um, and it doesn't encourage, it doesn't uplift. Now, there's a time for constructive mm-hmm. criticism. There's a time that we need to be open to hearing that. But it usually helps if you know that person's coming with love. You know, it usually helps if you know their motive is for the betterment of of everyone and not just they've got something yeah. icky going on inside yeah. of them that, that needs to come out in order for them to feel better temporarily for about eight seconds. And, and then they'll need somebody else to criticize. But Paul also says here, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response for everyone. It's, an, it's a mission-oriented statement, too. So that you, it's not just in our day-to-day speech, but also as we testify about who Jesus is, that we would be, as Jesus says, wise as serpents and innocent as doves, that we would have that balance, that we would be able to, to talk about these things in a way that's compelling and not shaming. I'm going to get back to that again. Too much of Christianity these days is you should believe in Jesus and I'm going to shame you into it instead of let me... Um, let me follow Paul's lead here to the Colossians, where he will, he will put it out there. He'll speak a truth. But it's always with his heart and love. He even says in other letters, I'm crying as I write this because people have wandered. I love these people who've wandered away from the truth, and I want to lead them back to that truth. I hope that's our motive as church people. I hope our motive is tears of sadness because we want people to know Christ instead of, oh, those terrible people. Because there's so many voices in our world today that say, hate the people you disagree with. Yep. And that's what it's really all about. Uh, mock them, post things about them, say things about how terrible they are. And that somehow that's going to, it's like your mentor said, Jeremy, there must be something inside of you yep. that needed to say that because it really isn't about them anymore. Our words and our tone of our words can be a looking glass to our heart, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean there isn't yeah. a time to criticize. Yep. Doesn't mean there isn't a time to debate. Doesn't mean there isn't a time to have these tough conversations. But come on, Christian, you know, let your motive be love. Uh, yep. Let your motive be righteous. And, and let that witness that we have as missionaries of Jesus Christ, let it, let it be effective and that has to do not just with the words we use, but the tone. Yeah. And it's hard to get that right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, if you do have a day, like all of us do, where maybe your words just aren't kind yeah. and you're reflecting on that, an apology always goes a really long ways. Yeah. So it's not something that you need to hold on to and just be embarrassed by, but just apologize and recorrect your actions because that can really change someone's heart and mind on a situation. I have done that many times yeah. uh, for coworkers around here, family, friends. You know, it's it's. Um, I don't always get that right either. But boy, sometimes when you see it, just mm. instead of pretending you didn't, just admit you did. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, switching gears to wrap us up here today. What verse or section of Proverbs 16 through 31 stands out for you, and what do you want Bible readers to know about it? So. Proverbs 16, 25, kind words are like honey. Mm. <laughs> wow, right on <laughs> you. Yeah. Uh, Proverbs 16, 33, uh, we may throw dice, but God delivers how they fall or directs how they fall. 17, 9, love prospers when fault forgives, but dwelling in it. Uh, love pros- prospers when fault forgives, but dwelling on it separates friends. 
Rumors mm-hmm. are dainty morsels that sink deep into somebody's trust. Mm-hmm. I mean, my goodness. Okay. You, I mean, that's just that's just 16 and 17. Yeah. You could continue to go mm-hmm. on and on and on. So, yeah. It's good. Yeah. How about you, Anna? Um, I always get caught up on Proverbs 31. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful chapter. But also if you Google Proverbs 31, it's like how to be a perfect wife. Yeah. And I'm a new wife and I don't do any of those things. So <laughs> You I'm, don't have a field no. that you go out into and, no. and make your own clothes I'm rarely from the up field. before yeah. sunrise either. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say that if you read that and you feel discouraged, um, I just challenge you. And because we don't say it enough, that you are doing great and that you are great and that you are a daughter. You're loved and you're cherished. Mm. Right. It's not, it's not a prescription. It's a description of, of a particular, uh, well, an ideal, really, not even necessarily an actual person, but an ideal. And it's not that it's bad, any of those things, but the, it's, a pre, it's not a prescription. The prescription is who God made you to be. Mm-hmm. Be that, mm-hmm. you know, be, be that and be content with that and, and realize probably nobody's going to hit all those on that list. We talked about words, and here's a couple of Proverbs that stood out to me. On that, um, the Proverbs twenty twenty two part. Of, so we're in the back half of Proverbs right now. So I'll stay away from the first fifteen chapters. Uh, twenty twenty two. Don't say I'll get even for this wrong. Instead, wait for the Lord to handle the matter. Yeah. People think, oh well, the call to not take revenge on people doesn't come till the New Testament. Eh, it was right there. It was in the Old Testament wisdom literature. Um, anyone who loves to quarrel, Proverbs seventeen verse nineteen. Yeah. Anyone who loves to quarrel loves sin. That's blunt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you like to pick fights with people? You think that's fun and it's just who you are? Mm. The scripture says work on that. Because if you do that, if you love that, you love sin. And you're just, you're just doing that for you, probably. goes on to say, um, anyone who trusts in high walls invites disaster. I'll let people make their own application on that one. I'm just telling you, yeah. don't fight me on it. Fight, fight the word of God on it. If it's all about putting boundaries between you and everybody else all the time to protect you, you got a problem with scripture. There's one more. A lying tongue hates its victims. This is Proverbs 26, 28. And flattering words cause ruin. Um, flattery is a form of lying. Mm-hmm. When we just fluff people up, but we don't mean it in our hearts, we're doing it for us. Again, we're trying to manipulate them. We're trying to mm-hmm. try to get something out of them. Um, that's challenging, I think, in a world where a lot of people use that approach. Like, I'm going to say things I don't believe about you uh, in order to try to sort of encourage you, but deep down maybe my, 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 my darker, more prominent motive is I want to get something out of you. You know, I, I, I want to I try to do that. Now, sh- if we see people the way God sees them, the encouragement's going to flow freely. Mm-hmm. So be like, I have a lot of good things to say about you. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I can quickly come up with them. I start to see you like God sees you. That's not flattery. That's truth. And that's encouragement. And that's, there should be more of that. But when it's just manipulative flattery for the sake of trying to get something out of somebody, well, that's, that's not going to end the way you think it's going to end is what Proverbs is saying. What so many of these Proverbs are saying, it sounds good to the world, but deeper wisdom, God's wisdom, heavenly wisdom, um, will point you in a better direction. I, it's, so many of these are all about human relationships and the things that get in between them. And it's very down to earth. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe a common thread between Colossians and Proverbs is Paul saying Jesus is everything. The fullness of God's deity dwells bodily in the person of Jesus Christ. He says, but it's also that this Jesus is a down to earth God and mm-hmm. that our faith is very practical and that the life we live in this world matters. How we treat people today listeners. It matters. How we interact with people, how, how we care for people, how, how, what, what our motives are. It matters. Mm-hmm. And Colossians and Proverbs both point us to that. And it gets us back to that verse. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Keep your eyes on heaven. F- focus in on heavenly things. Bring more of heaven to earth. So mm-hmm. let's get to work on that. But it doesn't start by trying harder. It starts by remembering who we are in God's eyes. We are loved so much that he sent his son to die for us. More on that this weekend at worship. I can't wait to preach again on Colossians uh, and invite your friends, uh, invite uh, everybody to continue. And thanks for spreading the word about this podcast too. We will see you next week here on Pastor Mike Drop Live. Thanks for joining us today. Please make sure to like and subscribe on your favorite platform and we'll see you next time.